Good evening, welcome. This is the Marion City Council work session for Tuesday, April 17th. First up, we have a presentation from Link County Solid Waste Agency annual update. I'll wait for Mr. Michael. Sorry, I'm in your way here, Joe. Get uh, out of your way. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Joe Haraney, 217 Barrington Court, here on behalf tonight on the, of the Solid Waste Agency. Thank Gonna you. give our update on services and programs available to all Marion residents. Brief history of the Solid Waste Agency. We are a 28E organization that formed back in 1994 when the City of Cedar Rapids and Lynn County combined. Uh, we do not, we're not part of the city, we're not part of the county, but we do represent uh, everyone in Lynn County. We have a nine member board of directors with six officials from the City of Cedar Rapids, two Lynn County supervisors, including Brent Olson, and then one appointee from the City of Marion, Terry Chu. And then tonight I'm gonna to cover our two facilities, the County Home Road location and our Mount Trashmore location, downtown Cedar Rapids. The big news this year, we have no rate changes, so disposal fees will remain the same. Garbage will come in for $40 per ton. Uh, our flat fees for residents will also stay the same. So if you come out in a car, SUV, or minivan, it's a $10 flat fee. So you could have one bag of garbage in there or an SUV completely full of garbage, it's a $10 flat fee. For pickup trucks and full-size vans, it's a $20 fee. And I have gotten chewed out by several people for this who've come out in a pickup truck and they've only had two bags of garbage, upset about it, but I tell them that's the way it is. We encourage you take uh, take advantage of your curbside services and only come out to the landfill when it's a last resort. Our yard waste uh, fee will remain the same, $24 per ton. And then we also do have to charge for TVs and monitors, and that's based on screen size. The smaller TVs and monitors, 18 inches or smaller, $10 per unit. Larger ones, 19 inches and bigger, including the old CRT TVs, those are $15 <coughs> per unit. And two big messages that you'll hear from us uh, this spring in our advertising and social media outreach is one, if you're coming out to us, have your load covered and secured. This time of year, you know, the snow start, when the snow finally does melt eventually, uh, all the people that have been coming down County Home Road and up Highway 13, they come out to us and that stuff blows off. It causes a big litter issue. Um, and we have, our, we, this time of year, we have temporary workers that we bring in, five to six people every day, just out there picking all that material up. So if somebody comes into our site and they're uncovered, we do give them a fine. A resident coming in with a pickup truck, it's a $10 fine. Commercial vehicles and trailers, it's a $25 fine. That sounds harsh, but if they were coming up Highway 13 and the Lane County deputy pulled them over, they can get a ticket for spilling loads on the highway, it's $330. So we're trying to you know, keep it safe, keep it covered. And the other message that we're trying to get out is avoid Saturday if you can. If anyone's ever been out there on a Saturday, anywhere from 8 to 1 o'clock, you can be sitting in line, especially in May when spring uh, cleaning rolls around. Um, you know, your time is the most valuable thing you have, so we encourage folks, come out on a Tuesday or Wednesday if you can. Avoid Saturdays. Uh, this is our resource recovery building out at our County Home Road location. And inside here is where residents, uh, married residents are our, our most frequent customers, can come in, they can drop off their curbside recyclables when they have extra that they don't want to put out on their blue bin, so your paper, plastic, cardboard, all comes inside here. This is where the City of Marion trucks drop off their recyclables. And uh, last year, I believe I was here in front of you and I told you, you know, recycling markets are down. We had a one-year contract with Republic Services. We hope things will improve and that will be more value for recycling. Markets have gotten worse in the last year. Um, so we had to extend our contract with Republic. There was a slight increase that the agency is going to pay. And we're not passing that along to our customers. So when the City of Marion trucks come in, they'll pay the same rate that they paid last year. That increase, the agency is going to eat that. Also inside this building is where we do accept other materials for recycling that you can't put curbside. So electronics, other than TVs and monitors, we take all electronics for no charge. So old vacuum cleaners, stereos, uh, things like that, no charge. Fluorescent bulbs, no charge for residents. Batteries we also accept. Now your regular alkaline batteries, those can be thrown away. Your AAA 9 volt C and D, those don't have to be recycled. But all other batteries, lithium, lead acid, we take for no charge. And then household hazardous materials, so paints, chemical stains, cleaners, anytime we're open, Lynn County residents can drop that off, no charge. And then outside our facilities where we continue to accept uh, appliances and tires, there are a fee for those items. And again, those fees are not increasing this year. It's $9 per appliance. And then tires, it's $3 per tire, up to eight. And if they have a load bigger than that, we charge 15 cents per pound. And then we do take scrap metal for no charge. And again, we tell folks, if you think your scrap metal has any value, take it to Marion Iron. If you, for us, we usually just get old lawn mowers and snow blowers, things like that. Uh, but if you have you know, a lot of fencing, things that there is some value, we encourage them. We don't pay, you can drop it off for free, but if you want money, head over to Marion Iron at their very nice new facility. 
Environmental education, uh, we do have a licensed teacher on staff. This is our busy time of the year. Every sixth grader in the area comes through. So we have Lenmar, Marion Independent, Cedar Rapids Schools, Albernet Central City. All the kids come through. So basically they learn there's no such thing as throwing away garbage in Lynn County. When you put it in the garbage, they see where it ends up. So it's a great lesson for them. And then he's available to work with uh, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, groups like that, youth groups. So if you know anyone who needs that type of curriculum, give us a call. We can accommodate that. Our landfill gas energy project is still going uh, very well. It used to be you went up Highway 13 at night, you'd see that flare burning, look pretty cool in the dark, but now when you don't see the flare, that's a good thing. That means we are creating electricity. Uh, we create about enough to power 1,100 Lynn County homes each day. We have a purchase power agreement with SIPCO. And as the landfill ages, more gases will be produced. There might actually be the need for a second engine down the road. And initially we thought this was gonna take 10 years to pay for itself, and it's uh, doing better than expected. It looks like we'll see our return on investment in uh, seven years. And when the engine does go down for maintenance, the flare comes back on, so none of those landfill gases, like, such as methane, are accumulating. Uh, our Monarch Zone, we are taking part in this. This is one of three rearing tents that we have on site for Monarchs, and in the past two years, we've had more than 500 Monarch butterflies emerge out of these tents. And we realized when these Monarchs come out, they need food to eat, and Monarchs want milkweed. So to help with that out, last year we brought in 240 goats. There was a nice article in the Marion Times about this. Uh, they ate about an acre each day. They uh, were on top of our closed 30-acre cell, the original landfill out there in County Home Road. They had a portable fence. They moved from section to section. And then once they were done, we were able to put down a pollinator seed mix. We're hoping to see those uh, pollinator plants emerge this spring and beyond. So in the future, when those other monarchs come out, they can just fly across the road. And then uh, moving on to our uh, Cedar Rapids facility, Mount Trashmore. Our scenic overlook is, is basically done. Construction is done. There's some landscaping work that needs to be done this spring, and then we hope to open that up to the public uh, later this year. Trail construction is going to start on May 1st, and it should take six to eight weeks, weather permitting, to get that completed. Then once we do, we're going to open that up. There'll be a walking trail going to the top. Our service road will be available for bikers, and once bikers get to the top, we're going to have what's called a flow trail going from the top all the way down for mountain bikers. So we're very excited about this. We've been getting a lot of calls from the public. Um, it's, a, it's a great view. And so I included in here the slide just showing folks there are going to be rules for it. Mount Trashmore is a regulated site for, through the state because it is a closed landfill. So there will be limited hours of accessibility when the agencies open and just some other uh, trail rules to follow. But really looking forward to that. And we'll send out an invitation for when we do have the ribbon cutting probably in early July. And then it still does remain a working compost facility. So you can't take garbage there anymore. You can't take recycling there. But this is where yard waste uh, comes in from across Lynn County. And we do give compost away. I know we also give it away here in Marion, so we get the folks usually on the south side of Lynn County, but it, it's excellent material. We have it tested in independent labs and certified by the U.S. Composting Council before we give it away, and then we can give it away one ton each visit to residents when they do come in. And then for the city of Marion, for being a member of the Solid Waste Agency uh, in FY19, we will be giving uh, the city their recycling incentive for offering curbside recycling services. And for FY19, the city of Marion will get, receive uh, $66,620. And I just want to say uh, thank you for being a member of the agency. If there's anything that we can do for the city of Marion, please let us know and we'll try and do it. Thank you. Questions? I have one. Yes. Same question. Yes, last year. Yep. Um, cemetery. Yes. How are we protecting the Pauper Cemetery? Uh, I didn't get an answer last year. I did. I emailed you the answer well, last year. Paul didn't get Okay, you did not get it? Very well. I will go back into my sent mail and I'll right, look up the answer you. that I asked for you. Appreciate and I'll, it. And I'll, actually, I will call you too to make sure that goes through. Okay. All right. The solar project, that's absolutely not happening anymore? That, that's yeah. not happening. Okay. Unless uh, we receive another proposal for it, but right now there, it's been tabled and dead. And you said you have nine members on your board? Correct. Nine? How, how, is, how is the membership determined? You said there's six Cedar Rapids people? Six officials from the city of Cedar Rapids, and then it used to be three Lynn County supervisors, and the supervisors uh, gave one seat over to the city of Marion, and it's distributed through population. Okay. And the other cities aren't represented in any way? The supervisors it's represent through the, the other supervisors, communities. not yeah. separately. Pardon? I won't be able to have two supervisors in there. There'll oh. be a quorum. Oh, because we do the When they go to three. three. Yeah. Oh, what's going to happen then? Well, well, we'll still have two supervisors and then one appointee from the city of Marion. I, I do have one other question. I'm sorry. Um, I, I've had one of our citizens call me twice now concerning a benzine plume. Could you tell me what that is? Yes, we actually had a, a public meeting about this last night. Um, so the closed 30-acre cell, when the landfill opened back in 1972, was uh, operated by Lynn County. Um, 
some material that it had benzene in it was thrown away. Back then, there was no regulations. Oh. It's an unlined cell. Yeah, it got in there. So it, uh, benzene has been seeping out. So we have a, a well system uh, and gas monitoring systems that caught this. And so there has been an effort to remediate the benzene. So it has not reached Indian Creek yet. And so the efforts that the agency has implemented, uh, we've worked with an HDR engineering as well as our on-site environmental engineer to deal with this. They've taken several steps to remediate that, and the plume has actually uh, receded over the last uh, year and a half. And so the plan that they came up with, the model that they thought that the benzene plume would go beneath uh, levels that the DNR requires the reporting for, uh, would be done by 2022. Uh, within the last year, we've already gone beneath that number, but it has to stay underneath it for three years before we can uh, be taken a step further down for where the DNR monitors it. So we're showing good progress already. Um, we had a public hearing uh, last March, informed our neighbors about it, and then the meeting we had last night was voluntary. We just wanted to give them a yearly update on where things stand. And uh, so that's the case, that it has receded, and the methods we included updated wells to suck out the leachate, which helped with it, and there's several other steps too. Uh, what, what are we doing with it? Are we pulling it and running it through our sewer line, or what are we leachate doing? leachate gets sucked over, and it goes into the sewer line. Yeah. And we are working with the DNR is monitoring this, and it's, it's, it's okay. Other questions? Anything else you... you are looking for from us besides just um, giving us the information or? No, nope, just wanted to say again, thank you for being a member. And again, if whatever we can do, let us know. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, next we have a presentation on the Regional Transit Authority. This is a process that the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization has been going through with the with the member um, communities uh, to explore whether or not it, the, the feasibility of a regional transit authority. So, uh, hello everyone. I'm Bill Michael with the Corridor Metropolitan Planning Organization, and you'll have to forgive my slides here. I'm not exactly sure how to correct the uh, aspect ratio on there, but. Uh, um, we will uh, we'll get through here. Um, so thank you, Mayor and Council, for having me today. Uh, I appreciate your time. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to take about 10 minutes and simply uh, provide you with some information on a study that uh, the Corridor MPO, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, is doing. If you're not familiar with the MPO, we are a regional organization. We have nine member communities, including Lynn County, uh, Marion, of course, and then uh, Cedar Rapids, Fairfax, Palo. Uh, Robbins, Hiawatha, and uh, together uh, this organization administers the roughly $5 million we get annually in transportation funds for capital projects, roads, trails, and transit. In addition to that, we receive approximately $350,000 in planning funds, uh, which we use for uh, operations and conducting studies uh, like this. So uh, that is a very brief uh, background on who the MPO is. Uh, the um, purpose of this study uh, really came out of a uh, uh, 2016 transit study that uh, the MPO did. We decided to take a look at uh, a comprehensive look at the transit system. Uh, so that includes both CR Transit, which provides fixed route bus service to the cities of Marion, Hiawatha, and Cedar Rapids, in addition to lifts, uh, which provides uh, uh, various types of services, including on-call to uh, portions of uh, Lynn County. And some of the things that came out of that study uh, were some recommendations to make some, uh, some transit uh, changes, which were made, some route changes, and also found that a creation of an RTA uh, was feasible but required a bit more detailed analysis. Uh, and I, I won't go through them in detail, but there was a number of issues that were identified that needed to be studied to determine whether or not it made sense to, uh, to do this. Uh, one of which was a 95 cent per thousand dollar, uh, per one thousand uh, dollars of assessed value uh, that is a uh, transit levy cap. Uh, so the state law indicates uh, that's the maximum that uh, a city can exact on citizens for, for transit. Um, and so uh, 
RTAs are allowed through Chapter 28M of the state code, uh, similar to Chapter 28E, which uh, allows cities to make partnerships with one another, essentially. Uh, there is one RTA currently in the state. That's the city of Des Moines. If you're familiar with DART, uh, the Des Moines Area Rapid Transit, that is a regional transit organization. Uh, regional transit agencies are a single issue uh, agency. They are an independent agency. They have their own taxing authority and uh, some of the other duties and powers of a local government. Um, so this uh, study was separated into three phases. Phase one, uh, which is what I'm uh, providing you some information on now, is simply to determine, it, does this make sense to, uh, to continue to, uh, to study? So um, the 2016 transit study said, uh, this might be a good idea, and phase one of this study uh, is uh, taking a more detailed look at it. Are there some benefits and efficiencies to be had? And if so, let's continue to study it. What are our challenges, uh, that sort of thing. So there is an advisory group for this study made up of uh, the transit agencies, Lyft, CR Transit, and our member communities. Um, so I've outlined the purpose and need goals, and uh, I can make sure that you get this uh, presentation. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them because uh, it will simply uh, take too long, more time than we have today. but. Uh, we needed to clearly define the transit problem that uh, we're attempting to solve, identify those challenges, and determine if the RTA is a tool to, uh, to meet those. Um, we did I, uh, initially identify that uh, there were some benefits in improving regional mobility. Uh, municipal boundaries can provide somewhat of an artificial boundary to transit, uh, particularly fixed route transit and uh, also some barriers to long-term funding stability, specifically the fact that uh, CR Transit is a city of Cedar Rapids organization. So the Marion City Council, for example, and Hiawatha does not have direct oversight over uh, that organization. Uh, on the opposite side of that coin, um, CR Transit also then, uh, because it's not a single uh, agency, doesn't have any sort of direct control over the funding that they receive uh, from Marion Hiawatha as well. So there's uh, a few uh, uh, inefficiencies that were identified there, um, and there's a number of ways to address that, however. So, um, and the whole idea is to improve mo mobility uh, for residents. We have an aging population in the state and locally. Uh, we also, uh, the number of uh, uh, percentage of minority in our population is increasing. Those people uh, tend to take transit at higher rates than uh, the rest of the demographic of our population. Uh, as those two demographics increase, we will likely see, as with the national trend, more individuals taking transit. Um, there's also economic benefits. Um, as we all know, regions and cities compete not only for business and industry, they compete for people and uh, transit is uh, something that's uh, become more and more attractive, uh, particularly to millennials and that demographic when they're considering where to live. Uh, and there's some economic benefits that have been demonstrated of transit. Every dollar invested in public transit generates approximately three to four uh, in economic returns and uh, some other that uh, I've outlined, which again, I'll uh, make sure you, you get these. Um, there was a funding analysis done um, uh, you can fortunately see the majority of this slide. Uh, we started out with total taxable property value, and then currently Cedar Rapids has an 81 cent per thousand dollars of taxable value, and that right-hand column simply demonstrates how much is generated currently by each community for the operating budget of uh, CR Transit. So Marion currently has a uh, 0.26 uh, cent per thousand dollars of assessed value transit levy generating approximately $400,000. Um, and the city of Hiawatha uh, does contribute, um, however, it's out of the general fund, so that's why you see the, uh, the row for Hiawatha has a zero, but they do contribute just uh, simply in a different way. It's not via a transit levy. Um, so uh, something to make clear, uh, Cedar Rapids Transit also receives federal dollars. Uh, they receive... Uh, uh, then, of course, uh, as a part of the revenue stream, fare box revenue and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. So, um, okay, why is all this important? Uh, some of the challenges that we face uh, in terms of transit as a region, uh, when we eclipse the 200,000 population mark in our region, uh, that changes the way the federal funds can be spent 
so currently, uh, we uh, the CR Transit folks can spend 100% of their federal dollars on operating uh, as soon as we pass this 200,000 population threshold in 2020 they will lose the ability to spend about 25% of that on operating. So they can still use it on capital and other things, but they'll have to find a way to fill what's essentially going to become a $640,000 gap. So again, just outlining some of the challenges we face long term. Um, and this simply takes a look at what would the levy rate need to be to fill that gap. Um, and uh, moving on, you know, I think some of the... Uh, the things we face long term are that 95 cent uh, transit levy cap. Is that sufficient uh, over the next 10, 20, 30 years to support uh, increased costs for gasoline, um, for uh, wages, that sort of thing, for uh, transit to operate efficiently? Um, this is simply uh, a slide demonstrating uh, current operating budget of $5,700,000. That's uh, fiscal year 18 for, for uh, CR Transit. If, if we made this uh, a truly regional agency and, and I was asked to generate this number just as a starting point, what if everyone paid the same levy rate? Again, this is not recommended and we're not suggesting this. It's just simply a, a place to uh, understand what would it be if uh, we started here, and it would be about 70 cents, uh, so 0.69 uh, in terms of a levy rate. Um, and this table simply demonstrates what that would mean for a homeowner or a property owner, excuse me, of 50,000, 100,000, 150,000, you know, on a, on a monthly basis on that right-hand column. Um, so... Uh, anyway, the, the summary of that funding analysis is, uh, you know, we're still well under as a region that 95 cent per $1,000 cap, um, but over a long enough period of time, uh, that's probably not enough to support uh, transit in Des Moines or here. So that's something we'll have to figure out uh, as a state and as a region uh, as costs increase. Um, so we, we also did a, a peer review of other governance models, and uh, this is something you can simply review when I send, send you these slides, but it's got information about the typical size of a board, term length, that sort of thing. Uh, key lessons that we learned, um, don't expand too quickly if you do move to an RTA. Um, the upsides are autonomy provides more flexibility to meet mobility needs, and as I mentioned, you create that single issue agency. Um, here's the, the meat of it. There were three alternative scenarios created, uh, the status quo and the pros and cons of uh, the, what we have today, the system we have today. Uh, the pros of the status quo are that uh, CR Transit maintains the connection and access to all City of Cedar Rapids administrative and other services. Uh, so specifically what I'm talking about is IT, HR. Um, finance, all of those services, uh, if you were an independent agency, you'd have to pay for on your own. Of course, that costs money. Um, and the cons are the service provider has limited control over transit service funding, planning and operations in Marion and Hiawatha have no direct oversight over transit services uh, in their community because it's a department of the city of Cedar Rapids. Um, so there's less flexibility there for regional transit service delivery. A second option is simply formalize the agreements that we have today uh, on an annual uh, basis. Uh, CR Transit signs a contract with Hiawatha and uh, also with the City of Marion. So um, some pros to, to doing that, it would establish uh, a planning body to provide some input on service delivery and uh, hopefully create a more equitable cost sharing system and annual budgeting would become easier. The third and final option is uh, to go all the way to an RTA. And uh, there's some efficiencies to be had, particularly if we can pull in lifts and the 17 other agencies that provide uh, some of those uh, on-call services uh, that all receive some federal, state, and local funding. So um, that's pretty much where I'm going to stop. In summary, uh, the RTA is one tool in the toolbox. I'm simply here to provide you with some information. Uh, it appears like... Uh, Based on the, the feedback I'm getting, I've, I've done one of these in Robbins uh, just recently, and I've talked to uh, Lynn County Board of Supervisors, and there's some interest in continuing on with the study uh, for the following reason. 
Um, despite whether or not we would actually decide to move uh, to an RTA or not, we still face the same long-term transit challenges. And so regardless of whether or not the RTA is the solution, uh, we still need to uh, find one. So um, anyway, I think that's where I'll stop. I'm happy to answer some questions. And again, I'll make sure you get these slides. So, Thank you. Um, would you just summarize like, where we are right now in the process? What's the, what's the, I mean, I know you're sure. going to the communities and explaining what's happened so far, what the study, what the study has shown, but um, what's, what's the next step? So uh, I am going to make presentations. Uh, at, uh, I did already at the city of uh, Robin City Council here, Hiawatha, Lynn County Board of Supervisors and Cedar Rapids and, and get some input uh, from all of the elected officials. And then I'm going to get that uh, advisory group back together and sort of uh, summarize the feedback that I've received from the elected officials. And uh, then we're going to talk as a group. Is this something we want to continue to look at? Or uh, are we going to set this aside for now and, and pick it back up another time? So, so the way the, uh, the contract with the consultant was uh, formatted was so that uh, if we decided to stop the phase one, then we didn't have to spend uh, the rest of the money, essentially. So, so for, for us as a council, as, as a city, um, before you have that, bring back the, the advisor group together, yeah. what do we need to have done? Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I, I think uh, really, uh, so uh, serving on that uh, committee is, uh, is, is the mayor, of course, and, and uh, I know uh, Lon has uh, uh, had a conversation with me about it as well. Um, I, I think uh, having uh, an idea of uh, your uh, thoughts on this, is this something you would like to continue to study? Do you see value in it? Uh, or is uh, this something that uh, at this point in time uh, the council does not feel as though, uh, you know, we really need to continue to, so to it's discuss it's and talk about it? It's a decision of do we want to continue to explore or not? <laughs> not do we want to participate in a transit authority? Yes, yeah, okay. that, that's a, a very uh, uh, important distinction to make. I'm, yeah. I'm not asking uh, the council to uh, decide whether or not they want to participate. I'm simply asking uh, for an opinion on whether or not you'd like to continue to, uh, to study the issue. Okay, I just wanted to clarify those yeah, things. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Michael? <laughs> Well, a couple questions, uh, comments. Uh, it kind of sounds like obviously <coughs> funding and financing is always going to be a challenge yeah. on how that's done. Is it being done in an equitable manner? Mm -hmm. uh, second of all, it sounds like you're always going to you're trying to are you trying to do this in a more try to figure out with an RTA how you can do it for the entire region in a more equitable, economical, collaborative manner. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can bring more groups in together, operate it under one roof instead of everybody doing their own, I mean, is that one of the, it sounds like some of that's going on, but not to the, if that's one of the next major steps, then that sounds yeah, a little more that, interesting. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the study has indicated that, uh, so uh, a on-call service, for example, uh, tends to cost double or triple per ride what a fixed route uh, uh, service does. And so uh, if we can find a way to consolidate some of those, uh, the entire region will save money on transit in addition to uh, if we can consolidate uh, some of the uh, 18 uh, organizations that provide on-call services there's some economies of scale there as well uh, in addition to um, I think it does provide uh, an opportunity to create a more equitable funding and uh, oversight uh, governance model as well it's more consistent funding stream I mean yeah more dependable exactly. funding stream mm -hmm. yeah we hear about people all the time that might need some assistance, but uh, the bus route has stopped for the night or it doesn't go to that particular area. Right. Uh, a smaller vehicle may ha be a little more flexible, uh, mm -hmm. obviously a little more economical as well. So right. if you got one group kind of overseeing all of those needs, you know, perhaps uh, all of the citizens might get a little more flexibility built yeah. into their schedules. Yeah, and I think despite the... Uh, you know, the obvious boundaries that we see as uh, people who are involved in local government, individuals who are considering moving here or that use services in our region do not see those uh, those boundaries and and they simply uh, expect kind of a seamless, uh, you know, uh, uh, 
transit system that uh, doesn't really consider those boundaries. And I think there's an opportunity to, to make some headway uh, in that regard here. So one question, is the ridership over the past several years on the, on the buses, has the ridership been, how's it been changing over the past several years? Yeah, so it, it's, uh, it's interesting. Um, so CR Transit ridership fixed route has been up slightly and uh, lifts, so Lynn County lifts, uh, and this is a national trend for on-call and uh, uh, you know, service for individuals with disabilities and that sort of thing has been down slightly, uh, but it's trending back up again. So, um, and uh, but you know, order of magnitude here, we're talking in the thousands of riders, not you know, wild swings or anything. But yeah. other questions or comments? Um, I would just say um, because this is my first um, presentation like this. What would compel me to want to see more of this is knowing if our citizens have identified this as a need. We do a lot of surveying um, on projects and things that we want for the city. I have my own car, so I wouldn't need the service, but if it's something that the citizens um, continually identified, then it might be worth considering resources into it. I haven't heard that we do, but I yeah, haven't sure. asked, so I appreciate okay. the information. Well, there's some... Uh, the same suggestion was made by your city manager. In addition, there was some that happened during that 2016 transit study. I can send that along uh, with the slides as well. So, Thank you. Yeah, thanks for your time today. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Looks like we're right on schedule. And I will turn the gavel over to Mayor Pro Tem. Okay. Um, next we have a presentation regarding uptown development projects. Uh, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, what I wanted to do here was to just take a few minutes to really kind of set the context for the council before we moved into uh, the discussions about the specific Marion mixed use project on the Marion Square Mall site. Um, this uh, PowerPoint I'm going to do has its roots in a presentation that was provided to the council last year, but obviously three of you have joined the council since then, so I thought it would be good to go through it for a refresher. And it's got a little bit of updated information in it as well. Um, but to go back to really the beginning about all the stuff that's been going on along our central corridor. You have to go all the way back to 2009. And one of the things I think that um, sometimes get lost in this is that at its core, the central quarter plan was about um, increasing public safety and then also taking advantage of the railroad corridor that the city had purchased and figuring out what to do with that to really maximize the benefit that it provided back to the community. Um, I know I've used this statistic before, but when that study was done, one of the things that it revealed was that uh, more than half of the city's traffic accidents happened between Blairsbury Road and Hy-Vee. And that stretch of road is about a mile and a half long out of 160 miles of road. So there was definitely a problem there that needed to be addressed. Uh, and this study was designed to help us figure out the best way to do that, with the result being that they said we should take the uh, railroad right-of-way and turn it into a new parallel 6th Avenue. Uh, essentially, with 7th Avenue, because of the number of left turns on there, uh, you didn't have the potential for eliminating accidents the way that you would if you moved the through traffic over to a new route that had access control. Uh, that same year, the uh, Chamber of Commerce launched their Imagine 8 initiative, and one of the eight ideas that came out of that was to expand the city's library. Um, with the uptown completion of the uptown plan in 2010, the corridor plan got refined, and that's when this concept of taking the uh, footprint of our existing uptown um, from its current size, which is about the size of a downtown in a city of 6,000 people, and giving us the space to bring it up to the footprint that a typical one for a city of 50,000 would have. That's the defining feature of the 7th Street and 15th Street roundabouts, is that they're kind of the boundaries of where that vision is for that expansion expanded urban footprint. So what is an urban footprint? An urban footprint generally features more verticality, uh, multi-story buildings, parking structures, um, 
with the improved transportation systems that comes with that, they're typically designed more about walkability. Um, so you've got wider sidewalks, you have better lighting. Uh, there are also goals to change the aesthetics coming through the central corridor along with the traffic safety that I had talked about before. Uh, finally, we wanted to make it more welcoming to other modes of transportation beyond just cars and then the key to it and really making that safe when you're mixing those modes of transportation was to implement access control along the new corridor. Uh, second goal was as part of the central corridor project, I think starting in 2003, we had accessed some EPA funding. So we had a pretty good idea of where our brownfields were coming down through the central corridor. Um, that's what led to us acquiring that right of way. Uh, since then, we've amended our uh, economic development policies to provide tools for uh, businesses and developers to remediate brownfields along the corridor and uh, to access outside resources to do that. Um, the brownfield tax credits existed when we started, then they came up with the workforce housing program. Um, what will be available in the future, we can't really say uh, with any certainty, but Marion has accessed both of those. Uh, third goal was to provide opportunities for redevelopment. This is where leveraging that corridor came in. Uh, part of doing that was to create opportunities to consolidate parcels and aggregate them into larger pieces to allow room for larger projects. We also knew that um, with the right-of-way acquisitions that we were going to have to do, that we were going to have some excess property left at the end. Uh, one of the things with the central corridor plan update that we want to see is some direction and some ideas about what those properties should be used for. Um, you know, we know we're going to have it, and I can tell you that there's a generalized sense, for example, that we need urban housing, but I don't know along that whole central corridor from 7th to 31st Where's the best place to do that? That's the kind of direction we'll see coming in from the update to the central corridor plan. Um, we wanted to take advantage of opportunities to try to preserve uh, Marion's history, particularly in the uptown area, and finally, um, to help with the uh, redevelopment and creation of more tax base. Uh, at the time the original study was done, I think more than 60% of the parcels in the study area carried taxable values of $100,000 or less. Not that that's a terrible thing, but when that's your prime commercial corridor and your main commercial corridor going through your community, it means that as far as a dollars per square foot value for what it could be contributing to the tax base, it was underperforming. So when we started getting more specific about the library, one of the first things that they did was to conduct a facility needs assessment. And at the time, they identified the need uh, that um, they already had, the, had a current need for 65,000 square feet. Um, that's really, really, really expensive, and it just wasn't within the realm of affordability for what we knew we were going to be able to do, so we started looking at other alternatives. Um, even with the project that's on the table now, we know that there's going to uh, potentially be the need for another branch for the library at some point in the future, whether that's 10 years out, 12 years out, uh, don't have any certainty on that yet. So that culminated in a cost-benefit analysis that was done and then prepared uh, and then presented to the library board where they looked at a couple of different alternatives. The expansion of the existing library, doing a single-use standalone library somewhere else, and then doing a mixed-use one. Uh, the mixed-use one was the one that was selected. Um, it had the best cost-benefit ratio for the community at, at that time as far as you know the dollars per square foot that you got for the investment that you yielded. Uh, and I think there was at the time and continues to be a strong sentiment on the library board that um, it's very important that the main branch of the library may uh, stay in the uptown area. Um, if you look at the demographics of the uh, surrounding census tracts, uh, they are the ones that may skew a little bit towards the moderate income portion of the community and they do have a lot of people that walk so they wanted to make sure that the library could continue to serve those populations. So then later that year, they did a uh, uh, request for qualifications for a development partner to help them work through this project because mixed use was a whole different animal. They selected Ryan Companies, and initially we were really looking at that lot in between City Hall and the library. Um, then uh, we got contacted out of the blue from the prior owner of the Marion Square Mall indicating that uh, they wanted to come meet with us because they were contemplating either redeveloping that site themselves, um, doing a moderate redevelopment on the site, uh, basically a facelift, or um, selling the property and ultimately they uh, elected to sell the property. So 
go to 2017 and we, in March, a request for proposals was put out for the redevelopment of the existing library site and uh, Aspect Architecture and Knutson Construction put together a joint proposal that was subsequently accepted. So that leaves us with the Marion Square Mall site, and I'm doing the broad brush stuff right now. They'll, they'll, you'll hear more details on it soon. But essentially what we're looking at is a 46,000 square foot library. The existing facility is right around 24,000 square feet. Um, there'd be 74 residential units above, um, and the difference between this proposal and the one that the council had seen earlier the last time this was put together was that a second commercial floor has been added. So whereas before you were looking at around 10 to 12 12,000 square feet of commercial space. Now total you're talking uh, around 56,000 square feet. So that, that's a pretty significant change. Uh, the other change that's happened is that now with the uh, Imaginex visioning process, uh, the plaza has really become front and center with being named one of the future four projects under the term the heart of it all. With the existing library site where the building is at right now, uh, what Aspect Architecture has envisioned is also a mixed use building um, with an employer that would be an anchor in the facility. Uh, it actually would consume probably about 70 to 80 percent of the main floor uh, with some retail on one of the corners and then an additional 75 units of residential. Their initial proposal looked at the block between those two buildings, between City Hall and the existing library, and has potential for a parking ramp with about 350 spaces. At some point, you could put retail on the, the main floor of that facing the 6th Avenue side. Um, it would have a skywalk coming over to the new building on the Marion Square Mall site and then would be anticipated to have some drop boxes in it. So you've got um, not only do you have to figure out a location for the book drop for the library, but then we have a mailbox in the alley in between and then we have the utility drop box here at City Hall that uh, while nice for vehicles actually requires them to come in the driveway the opposite direction from the way traffic needs to flow. So it would be an opportunity to consolidate those as well. So when we start to take, looking at, take a look at the impact that that has, I mean it provides more opportunities for retail. It addresses long term the parking problems or perceived parking problems in the uptown um, as well as opening that the existing library site for redevelopment. Financially, uh, this is where the project sits, and again, you'll hear more detail on this one soon. Uh, but between the two, and this does not have the library included in this part of the total, it's about a $27 million proposed project with 16.37 of that being retail and commercial and a little over 11 on the residential. The library itself is about another $14 million on top of that. On the existing library site, the proposal over there would be another facility between 23 and 24 million, around 6.3 million for commercial and retail. That's single floor, so less investment there. Um, and then about estimated at about 17.5 million on the residential piece. Uh, the parking structure, where we're at, is uh, we have been in discussions with the Economic Alliance and by extension the Park Cedar Rapids group to see what options are out there for ownership and, uh, and operations and maintenance of a parking structure. Right now the City of Marion has no particular expertise in-house for managing parking structures. Uh, we can clean a, uh, an on-street parking place with the best of them and stripe it with the best of them, but this is a whole new ball game for us. This, they do it in downtown Cedar Rapids. Um, They've done some initial work for us and concluded that there is potential there for them to create a nonprofit that would own the ramp um, and then there would be an O&M lease or potentially even an o &M operations and maintenance and capital lease with the city to get that constructed. Um, we have been looking at outside funding from the Economic Development Administration for, the for that project. The key to it would be there is that um, it has to be tied to a particular business. So you have to have a qualifying employer that's going to commit to creating jobs. Um, they have to sign the pre-application and then they're responsible for creating that to leverage EDA dollars. It's not something that we're viewing as critical for 
putting the parking ramp in, but it may mean the difference between a three floor and a floor f and a four floor parking ramp, for example. Uh, that's just something that uh, we'll get more clarity on. Uh, it's difficult for either Aspect or for Ryan to go out and have uh, conversations with businesses about signing leases without having everything ready to actually pull the trigger on a project. So overall, um, one of the questions that we get is why would the city look at doing a project like this? And this is the broad brush version of why. Um, right now, if you look at those three blocks, there's only two taxable parcels on both blocks, and both of them together pay about $65,000 a year in property taxes. So if you fast forward and the project is complete, you have three parcels, um, assuming that retail gets put underneath the parking <laughs> ramp, that are taxable, and the total between all three is about $890,000 a year in property taxes. Now, one of the things that I think is key for people to understand about this is that that original 67000 which right now goes to Marion Independent, it goes to the city of Marion, it goes to Kirkwood, it goes to Lynn County, that is always there. That will never go away. So, you know, any of the existing taxing entities that are currently receiving property taxes from those properties don't ever lose a dime of those dollars. But when they look down at the bottom, there's one of the things about tax increment financing that even if the city were to fully utilize 100% for as long as we could, there's a piece of that new tax bill that we can never touch. There are certain levies like the city's debt service levy, Kirkwood's debt service levy, school, county debt service levy, um, that are not subject to tax increment financing. So that $65,000 a year, once these projects are done, goes to an estimated $114,000 a year. And then again, that's even if the city, if that's, if the city were to uh, use every single penny of increment that we could, there's still going to be almost a $60,000 a year net benefit to the taxing entities for uh, this project moving forward. Beyond that, you have your indirect benefits. Um, between the two projects, um, you could see uh, maybe as many as 250 to 300 new uh, employees. Uh, you've got the integration of the library with the heart of the uptown and the plaza concept. Uh, one of the things that we've discussed a long time is how do you kind of capitalize on the traffic coming in and out of the library. Uh, I would submit that right now it's really kind of divorced from the uptown because the bulk of the traffic comes in the south side. You get into a dedicated parking lot, get out, walk into an isolated entrance, go into the library, come back out and get in your car and leave. You never have to walk past a business or you never walk past someone's window. Um, by putting it in the middle, that would change. Um, you have new residents coming in, and uh, for those of you that were involved with our branding initiative, when that was completed, one of the statistics that uh, Roger Brooks used that has really stuck with me is that people that would li live within walking distance of businesses in uh, downtown or uptown will spend $6,000 more a year at those businesses than somebody that has to get into a car and come to those businesses. So, you know, you're talking uh, 150 new housing units would be a big benefit to uptown businesses, uh, along with new spaces for uh, future businesses. Uh, you also get the plaza and park upgrades. Um, you get additional parking. We have the opportunity then to remediate brownfield conditions on the site and you start to build that density and with the uh, skywalk you do have a separated crossing at 6th Avenue to allow people to cross without having to be at street level. So the key decision points that are coming forward, there's going to be a lot that are going to be coming towards the council. Uh, 11th Street, I have that on there. That's the piece of 11th Street in between the existing library and the block over here in between City Hall and the library. Uh, the council had in prior action said that they were okay with closing that, and I think that will be reflected in the updated central corridor plan. Um, we still need to determine how the parking ownership will work out what the pro forma looks like for that and whether or not um, there would be a need to put the retail in there at this point or whether that's just a future project and then phasing. Um, in almost any scenario to do the project you have to start the parking ramp first because the other properties are really going to be uh, at the mercy of having that parking in order to be able to be successful. But Logically, you'd start with parking, and then that would be followed by the Marion Square Mall property. And finally, once the library could actually move, then um, you'd go over and work on the existing library site. 
So that's really kind of the context for it. You know, I know we'll hear more specifically about the Marion Square Mall project right here uh, following this, but when we look at it in terms of the overall uh, redevelopment and new development of Uptown, that's the full context. Thank you. Any questions or comments for Lauren on this? One question. Um, I just found out actually about the 11th Street possibly being closed. So where does that stand? I mean, is that something that has been decided by past city council or is that something that is to be decided in the future? Um, the, the council had said that they were okay with closing it. So it was one of the alternatives that we were exploring with the update of the central corridor plan. But I don't believe we've taken action to um, declare it to not be right of way or anything like that at this point. All of that still has to be done before um, you could actually contemplate closing that section <coughs> of the street. Uh, the main difference is that the original uptown plan, uh, if you remember, if you've heard people refer to the pound sign, um, actually contemplated reopening 11th Street um, through the park yeah. and through the area where the uh, prior bus stop was. And when we started looking at this project and looking at the redevelopment of the area around the park, I think there was a sense from later councils that we were not going to, they were not going to be supportive of opening that stretch of 11th Street. And if we weren't going to open that stretch of 11th Street, then it really didn't make them, the next piece between 5th and 6th Avenues really wasn't critical. The other piece, though, that um, really ties into that is that um, council also asked to us to take a look at the possibility further south somewhere of bringing 10th and 11th Street together so that rather than having property come or cars come up 11th Street, hit an abrupt stop, turn, go over the 10th, and then come up, whether there were any opportunities to divert that traffic over and bring it up 10th Street further south of Uptown. I mean, the only, again, looking as I look at now, and I was not involved in those conversations, you know, I, when 6th Avenue does get opened up, I do see that obviously being a lot, bringing a lot of traffic that can turn south on 11th Street and head towards East Post Road. So, I mean, so I'm, uh, I'm assuming there's got to be some consideration on how to move that traffic easier uh, on a southern route. Yeah. So. Yeah, that was one of the thing, the reasons why I think they wanted us to look at the integration of 10th and 11th further south so that people would have the option of using, using 10th, uh, especially with 11th coming up and dead ending more or less at the uptown. It didn't really make much difference whether that happened at 6th Avenue or 5th Avenue because it was ultimately that was what was going to happen with it. And long term, it might be better to have people diverted over to 10th Street already further south before they even come in and hit the uptown. Yeah, if you marry 10th and 11th, I can... I can understand that. Yeah. All right, thanks. The concern, I want to piggyback on that one. The concern I have with shutting 11th down is the school traffic. Um, when you would come to this T, you would make a left or right, obviously, during drop off and pick up times from Starry Elementary. Starry? Yes. No, Vernon, Vernon, Vernon. Middle School. Vernon. During, those, during those school hours, this whole block area is very congested. Um, you can't even get into City Hall's parking lot because parents are sitting in the driveway trying to, you know, pick their kids up. There's no places to stop. So I, that is a concern that I do have by shutting 11th off at that point. We've had those, you know, those conversations about, you know, you're either going to have to go south or north, or excuse me, west or east of, of that diversion. And that, that's the, that is my biggest concern of totally shutting that road down is is that extra traffic from 7 to 8 30 and from 2 30 to 4 o'clock during those school you know the school times I don't know if that's something we put a lot of consideration there do we know what our traffic count is on 11th in between that block that number's got to be fairly high no, it's not. the last traffic count they did was last year the DOT actually came in and did the tube counters we haven't got those official results yet um, we are going to go out and do traffic counts, but until it stops snowing, we can't get our traffic <laughs> counts out there either. So. Understood. I just wanted to kind of point that out. I know everyone has different thoughts about that, but thank you. Anyone else? Um, I would just say I think it's a super exciting project to come to the heart of Marion to take advantage of that the prime real estate, um, bring in amenities for residents, jobs. 
um, businesses. I think the look, I don't know if that's final or not, um, is very neat. I, I've, um, I'm curious how it will look juxtaposed to the opposite side of the street. Um, but uh, I think overall this is a great boon for the city, and I'm looking forward to learning more as we move through this. I'm glad this is um, back in front of current council so that we can make some decisions and move forward. Okay. Um, now we have a presentation regarding the Marion Mixed Use Project, so we'll go a little deeper. Um, this is by Genesis Equities. Can you email that deck? Uh, and maybe we have it, but could you send that yep. deck you went through? Thanks. Mm -hmm. I couldn't write fast enough or get a couple of those things done. It's our stupid decision to use it. And James was here earlier, too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, of course, we're having IT problems. IT IT guy first. <laughs> you want me to do that one? Oh, that one. Oh, try F4. It was working until Tom helped him up. <laughs> yeah, until Tom came up. Joe, you know how to run that thing? <laughs> yeah, maybe I just need to pull it closer. Sorry, Beth. IT oh, things so are taken care of, we think. Look at that. There we go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Here we are. We're ready. We lost Steve. Um, <laughs> it's about. So good afternoon. Uh, we are here uh, and very excited to be presenting to you today the Marion Mixed Use uh, project as it stands today. For many of you, you've been following this uh, for the past three years as we've tried to really determine the right site, the right project, and what's going to be best for the community. And we feel very confident that we are coming to you today uh, to request some action on a project that, that we believe is at the right time with the right components um, and right for the community. Um, we Lon really touched on a lot of this, but it is uh, it has morphed from a number of different things. Ryan Companies was awarded in December of 2014, uh, the mixed use development project. We uh, very quickly uh, engaged Genesis Equities as our housing partner. So we've been at this uh, partnering for a long time, not having a shovel in the ground. Um, but we felt it was really important that we brought someone in uh, that was going to be the long-term uh, manager of the housing in Uptown Marion. We felt that was a really important component. And so Genesis stepped up to the plate at that point, and um, we started really evaluating what kind of project was going to be best for the community. We've come up with a four-story building, and we'll show you some graphics, but we thought it was important to give you sort of an overview of where we were. Um, it's a four-story building with a total of 177,000 square feet. 16,500 of them are retail, uh, 
10,200 facing 7th and about 6,300 facing 6th, 45,000 square foot of library, and about 40,000 square foot of office space or commercial space that will be on the second floor. We also have uh, 68,500 square feet of apartments. We have one and two bedroom market rate apartments that we will be building. And then, of course, the planned parking structure across six will provide parking and skywalk access, which is critical for the project to move forward. The total cost for private investment, not inclusive of the library, is 27400000 approximately. That's the budget that we're going off right now. The location map, um, we, we show uh, a lot of, of uh, folks where this is, but we're talking about the parcel that's actually outlined in red. It's, it's the block that the current Marion Square um, retail uh, is on. It does not include um, the vacated 11th Street. That will be the area that, as Lon described, will be for the, um, the plaza area. But it, we really view it as the gateway to uh, City Park. We think that the library facing the park and it really being an interactive space is one of the things that makes this project so unique and really just so exciting. This is the view that you would be looking at the site coming going east on 7th Avenue. So that would be the entrance to the library midway through. We anticipate there being retail um, facing uh, 7th Avenue and then the parkade would, or, um, excuse me, the plaza area would uh, be really for pedestrian traffic only. This is the view going east on 6th. It gives you a good sense of where the skywalk would go across. There's been a lot of questioning about the skywalk and actually its, its um, location. The skywalk height is based on a bridge height. We want to make sure that no one gets stuck um, at the skywalk, that it is uh, has the capacity to handle any traffic that would com be coming through the uptown for any reason. Um, and it would come in at the uh, commercial level with wayfinding and easy access down to the library and secured access up to the housing. So it would allow for uh, access to, to all of the above. We're just going to show you some, some um, concept renderings of floor plates. Uh, this is obviously the library with retail facing 7th. The second floor, commercial, we anticipate uh, it probably will be multi-tenant. We anticipate probably two or three tenants. We could, if someone wants all 40,000 square feet, that would be great. Mm -hmm. But we're assuming that it would be a couple office users that would, would have, um, you know, 20 to 10 to 20,000 square feet total. And then the third floor, uh, we get into residential. Um, right now, we are looking at a number of, of different things. And I'm going to let Hannah talk about the residential because that's really their area of expertise. But these are just, again, concept renderings that, that we're working off of. Thank you. Um, so in working with Brian and companies, we thought it was important to um, explain that, that the transition between us in terms of the partnership, but truly this project is going to remain co-developed between um, Genesis Equities and Ryan and companies, so our involvement's um, going to be uh, very much together in this, and Ryan and companies is going to continue to be the lead and the primary on the library portion of it specifically. So um, as she mentioned, when we, when we first came into this, the, the residential housing component really was our primary focus and involvement. And it's kind of morphed into so much more than that with the uh, commercial and retail, you know, needing a partner on that piece of it as well um, in order to make this work. And so uh, we took on the responsibility of the commercial and retail piece of it, being that the, <coughs> excuse me, property lease uh, management is, is really in our wheelhouse, both from a commercial and housing perspective. So the residential um, has continues to change a little bit in terms of exactly how many units and exactly what that is going to look like um, for sizes. We are looking anywhere from studio to one and two bedroom apartments and really market dictates a lot of that. And so it's changed already significantly throughout the course of mm -hmm. the ver various versions of the proposal. Um, and we expect that, that it's going to change a little bit between now and when construction actually starts. So we will uh, probably drill a little bit closer down into uh, exact quantities of, of how many of each of those. But the general range for rent would be anywhere from, um, I believe, $595 a month on up to about $1,200 a month, depending on if it's a studio versus a two-bedroom 
Um, we didn't feel that three bedroom was necessarily uh, as strong of a market right now. That could certainly change, but we do anticipate that the rentable square foot will remain the same. So ultimately, they'll remain market rate and um, we're working within the confines of um, with their workforce housing credits currently, there's a million dollar award that's been applied for that we're anticipating will be coming into the project. And there's uh, specific requirements along with that workforce housing credit to make sure that we stay within for the project. So um, that's one thing that we'll be doing. With uh, the residential, uh, I just wanted to point out on there, we've got some exterior components and some opportunities there for common space that will service the residential. We will be incorporating, and it doesn't show on any of these renderings, um, some integrated balconies. Um, they may be strategic as far as which units have them and which ones don't. But we wanted to make sure that there was some common space, uh, rooftop terrace area that would actually extend over top of the um, commercial portion because it kind of stair steps a little bit from the library to the commercial to the residential levels. And um, so having that common space in addition to some amenity space inside was important, we thought, for the project and um, unique for the uptown and taking advantage of the overlooking the park. So that was nice. Um, this is the fourth floor. It's really a mirror image of the of the third floor residential. Um, as they go through the schematic design, which is what we intend to be getting started on once uh, the pro pending the project approval, then that will get drilled down a little bit more so as in terms of exactly how that library, or I'm sorry, that lobby and things like that will um, integrate into there what those individual layouts will look like a little bit more and exactly what those quantities will be. Um, the request for TIF that we have proposed is a combination of economic development grants and TIF assistance. Um, we're looking for $6 million in economic development grant. Of that $6 million, um, there would be an upfront request for $250,000 of that, which would allow for the carrying cost to, um, to the start of the project in addition to some uh, discussions with, with tenants for potential um, early termination or buyouts of the leases, depending on what the needs um, and, and wishes are. So that would allow us some flexibility with that. The 4.48 million in TIF assistance is split out over um, for the residential five years at 100% and the commercial at 15 years at 100%. The reason for the, the difference between the residential and the commercial primarily is because this is a site that has about uh, 1.78 million in uh, tax base already in commercial that's got to be taken off of the, the new base that's going to be created. So there's not as much TIF available um, annually for the commercial. And so it, it needed to be extended over a little bit longer length of time. So the um, timeline for next steps, because we thought that was important, the parking structure um, is a big piece of this, um, as, as you know, and, and I know Lon and the staff is working on that piece of it. Um, we were working with the understanding that this would go to approval um, on Thursday, hopefully. And once we've moved forward with directing staff to negotiate that MOU agreement, we would anticipate before the end of the month to be um, providing at least a preliminary offer to tenants as to what that structure might look like. And then um, with you know formalized um, offers to be available once the actual MOU agreement is approved and the uh, motion directing staff to negotiate the MOU for the parking structure has taken place. So um, just to give you kind of an idea on a couple of those pieces, we anticipated that that would be um, the first council meeting in June is when that would take place and therefore by July 1st we could have um, some, some concrete dates as far as how this would move forward with anticipation for the parking structure breaking ground in November, middle of November and a December 1st project groundbreaking for the mixed use project. So um, that's the timeline that we've worked off of. Um, that's really all that, that we have. We wanted to make sure we left time for questions um, if you have any and um, Lon did a great job of giving the overview of the whole project. So we didn't, we we didn't were have able to, to go a lot through of the that stuff a yeah. little bit more. So yes. Um, I just want to start before we open it up to by thanking you for this timeline. This has been going on for a long time. There have been a lot of iterations. Um, and I think 
from many perspectives. Um, this is helpful. Obviously, each is contingent upon the step before it, mm -hmm. and I completely understand that. But um, for the few business owners that are in that space, I think this is hopefully helpful to them. So mm -hmm. thanks for presenting that tonight. Um, anyone have any comments or questions? I have a couple questions here. This might be for engineering and, and public works. If we were to move forward with this, is our infrastructure in place and what modifications would we need to uh, accommodate the water services? This is a huge, a huge change for that <laughs> volume coming in and going out. I'm just curious what your perspectives are on that. So Todd's not here at the water department. Um, I do know that in the uptown we do have some water pressure issues and there's some fire hydrants that the fire department is not able to um, fully use without creating a vacuum. Um, so that'll be ha something that we have to look at and maybe as part of the project they might have to do some kind of a booster in order to, to do that. But if we're talking about multiple, multiple story buildings, that might just might be part of the, how we figure that out. Um, there's sanitary sewer that's already there. Um, storm sewer, it's close, but I don't know that it's right there. So that is another thing that we'll have to look at. Um, mm -hmm. Currently, we do have RFQs out to find a consultant to hire 7th Avenue. And part of that study will be figuring out what the cross-section is on 7th Avenue and figuring out how we get those facilities up there. Um, even things like franchise utilities like the power, we'll have to figure out locations to stick some of those transformers. When we bury all those power lines, normally if they're overhead, you see the, the transformers on the poles. When we go to underground, we gotta find some location to stick those transformers. In the former Jiffy Lube site, they had an issue where they wanted to put the transformer on the roof. Alliance said no, because then we can't access it if we need to shut it off for an emergency situation. So then they wanted to put it in a vault under the street. OSHA won't let you do that because it's confined spaces. So trying to find that dedicated spot for that. So yeah, there, it's not gonna be a simple fix and we'll work with them to, to figure that stuff out, but lots of things to figure out on it. Right, and, I, and that's was one of the questions I was just kind of, as I'm looking at that, wondering about the, you know, we do have some infrastructure issues and what kind of costs are associated with that with the city that may or may not be part of the project uh, from an expenditure standpoint that the city would be incurring, obviously. So um, we haven't gotten into those details yet. Until we have a site plan in front of us to see what they're actually going to do, we don't know those details. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Anyone else? No, I don't. I have a question. I think. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Ages before. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's more for the parking structure lawn. So there's still one property that the city doesn't own over there. What's the status of that? Uh, we have had that one appraised, and uh, planning has been in contact with the property owner. So it's moving forward. So, okay. Thanks. No, my only thing is I'm pleased to see that you do have something for our current tenants built into your plan now and uh, kind of a timetable so they have an idea of, of what's happening there. So I think that's a big step forward for the calls that I've gotten anyway. And, uh, you know, the plan looks great to me. It's a little more modern than I would like, but <clears throat> it's across the street from buildings that, were built in 1800, so I know you can't replicate that, but um, it's a, it's really a it's an exciting <coughs> thing. So, you can start. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd echo the same sentiment as far as moving ahead with a project like this. Again, I've lived in Marion since '62. I think it's very exciting to have an opportunity to bring <laughs> a lot more people downtown. Again, when I was campaigning, I said this is kind of like a circular where you have more people living downtown, that's going to bring more businesses, that's going to bring more jobs, and it just keeps uh, being a circular. So I think there's a lot of positive around it. Again, we were able to meet, I don't know, for everybody else, we had the opportunity, city council people had the opportunity to meet with these two ladies uh, <coughs> last week, and so that gave us the opportunity to ask a few more detailed questions. I think the timeline is very important. Uh, Lon, from the standpoint, from a general question in that timeline, do you see that the parkade would fit into that timeline? It kind of sounds like there's a maybe a little more work to be done with that. Do you see that that timeline 
can fit in with this one here? The biggest thing with that is the m actual mechanics of what it would take to put the parking ramp projects together. Uh, one of the advantages that we have by working with the Park Cedar Rapids folks is that they work with, uh, on the back end, a company called Republic Parking, which is a nationwide firm that builds, owns, operates parking ramps. So they have an incredible amount of technical expertise that they can draw on. So I don't think doing the actual pro forma of it um, will take very long. Uh, what is going to um, generate a lot of discussion, and I think where we'll need some direction from the council, is the long-term financial plan for that. Um, for example, one of the things that they've indicated is that we had a discussion early on about whether or not their existing nonprofit would be able to build and operate the ramp. Um, they had looked at that as an alternative for Cedar Rapids, but they were precluded from doing that because of some of the conditions with the flood dollars. Uh, when they started to investigate, they determined that it actually would be better off to create a new nonprofit to do that in Marion versus trying to use their existing one. So um, the mechanics of how long does it take to get one of those put together. Uh, but I think we'd be able to be at the stage where we would know and the council could do a memorandum of understanding on that, outlining the parameters of the project, much like we do with tax increment financing, just knowing that we still had all the formal steps to go through to bring those decisions back. Uh, one of the big things that we'll have to really grapple with, and we've always, I think, kind of known Marion was heading that direction anyway, is what do we do with on-street parking? Uh, everywhere that you look, every place that has parking ramps has fees for on-street parking. Uh, it's part of the discussion that we have to look at, but we'll need to see, you know, would that be 10 years from now, eight years from now? I don't know until we get more into the details with uh, Park Cedar Rapids and Republic what that looks like. Because I know there's been discussion at, at least at some point in time, at least in the beginning, that the parkade would be at no cost to everybody that parks in it, including the tenants that are in these apartments or the commercial space. But at some time in the future, it does have to move mm -hmm. to some uh, cost for that for those individuals and probably anybody that's going to be using it at that point as well. So it kind of sounds like part of that decision and support for the parkade might have some <coughs> impact on our budget, at least in the first during that period of time in order to support the parkade. Yeah, that's one of the things that um, we'll have to take a look at just as they structure the proposal, how they work through those issues. Um, you know, when I've talked to other communities that have parking ramps, uh, we've got some ideas about things that they'll, they've told me there are pitfalls to avoid with that. But one of the keys is really, you know, when you're going to start moving down this path, just make a whole bunch of the decisions early so that you know what you're going to be doing for the next 10 or 15 years and you have the whole plan adopted and everybody can be predictable about it. Uh, for example, one of the models that we've looked at with the ramp might be that, um, your library card is a two hour pass or like Iowa City does where your first hour is free and then you start paying if you stay there after that so that you're not, um, so you still have the ability to use it and circulate people around it. But I think uh, in discussions with Ryan and Genesis, they fully realize that um, it's not going to be able to be free forever. And right. when we've talked with the businesses that uh, have an interest, particularly in the aspect building, they also understand that it would not be free forever, but um, part of their incentive for wanting to come to Marion would be that it might be no cost for a period of time. Okay. Lana, I think I got the idea anyway that they uh, they developed kind of a prefab parking ramp that can in fact be built onto. If we want another story, we could do that. Is that yeah, you can do them two different ways. You can do them, uh, again, no particular expertise, but everything that I've been seeing is there's two basic types, poured in place and then uh, ones that are done in precast panels. If you do the precast panels, it's like giant Legos. Uh, as long as your foundations and everything and the underneath is designed, you can add a floor or add a floor later. That's a lot more difficult with the precast ones. There are some trade-offs because it sounds like the precast ones probably have, or the poured in place ones, uh, it seems like they might have lower operations and maintenance maintenance costs over time. So that's just one of those decisions that has to be made early on. That's where if we've got a business that really is willing to sign on the dotted line and we can go after the uh, Economic Development Administration funding, that might change how what you do. Well, and I have two quick follow-up questions on that. Uh, one is I understand there's been some core sample drillings on that site. Um, any concerns with any contaminants? or 
anything hidden underneath that lot. That seems to be our history. And the second thing is, is the Skywalk will incur some, obviously, some maintenance and uh, uh, services, uh, window cleaning, floor coverings, uh, those types of things. Do those come out of our uh, budget under streets, sidewalks? Uh, can you just elaborate on uh, just everything from taking care of the squeaky hinge, so to speak, until um, such time that's turned over? Uh, at this point, we're anticipating that that would be part of the O&M on the parking ramp, that it would be installed with that structure, be wrapped up in the financing with that structure, and be part of the responsibility for the operator. I can speak a little bit to the phase one and phase two. Um, we did both last year, and um, there are some things, there, there certainly were um, some concerns if we were going to do uh, a total excavation and do the parking underground. We thought we might run into some problems. We doubt that there will be much excavation ver versus what's there right now. So we don't see having um, some of the issues that we would have had had we gone much further down. And there's some bedrock concerns um, on in, in this area. So even hitting that would, would be adding costs. So um, it's one of the reasons that parking under the uh, facility was just eliminated just because of costs. Sure. And one thing we didn't show on our layout itself was um, kind of that retail perspective for the 6th Avenue side, which I would consider to be kind of our walkout basement level. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't have it here on our slides, but essentially it, um, it results in about the, the south third of the building. So um, when you consider that the, the elevation of what's there and, and the footings and things that are what's there, it really is um, by the time you bring it out closer to the, the edge of the property line, it really isn't going to be a ton more excavation. We feel it's going to balance pretty well. And um, that was the area that we had talked about there being a potential for another 6,500 square feet of retail or so. Um, there's really about 10,000 square foot there, but we're expecting some of that to need to be back of house uh, lobby that will continue down to the 6th Avenue elevation as well. And um, that way there will be access from 6th Avenue sidewalk to the elevators. We also are thinking that the library mechanicals may end up down um, in, in an area so there would be accessibility kind of speaking, you know, to, to being able to access them specifically because of the unique mechanicals that would be required for the library. Mm -hmm. Sure. Just in the same vein, I, my, my core sampling question was more um, aligned with the ramp itself um, because we understand that these are kind of uh, in harmony, so to speak. You're wanting the ramp before you get uh, to that level as well too and I just want to make sure we don't have any unexpected surprises on building the ramp. Um, historically we put the shovel in the ground and then we find empty fuel tanks and leaks <laughs> and contaminated oil from you know disposals from years past and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why I was just kind of curious as to what our core samples have been finding on the parking lot side our parking ramp side, I guess. If we've done any. Yeah, that's not something that I've looked into. I'd have to check with planning to see what records we have for that site. Uh, certainly, we've already acquired part of it, and we have parking on part of it, so uh, I'm going to make a leap and assume that anything that was encountered during that has been remediated. The ABC Connections building was newer, and um, that, that site would have had to have been done. So if we have exposure, it might be anything on the south side of that block. Um, but that's always been primarily residential. Uh, we would just have to have I don't know if we did a phase one on it or if we'd have to have that updated to see if there was even a need for any further investigation. Right. Sure. Your, your risk pr there primarily would be probably like old fuel oil furnace tanks or something like right. that. If there's something, one of those that's still sticking around. Okay. Sure, because I imagine um, something of that weight and magnitude is going to have some serious footings underneath it. So I was just curious, but thank you. Yep. Anyone else? Um, just for me, I had a couple quick questions. Deb, is that new ladder truck going to clear the uh, skywalk? Yes, it will. Okay. <laughs> All right. That's like the tallest vehicle I can think of that we have. And, um, yeah, I would just say, um, oh, wait, one other question for you all. The, the balconies that you mentioned, are the, all of those inward facing? There are none on 6th or 7th, correct? We, or we haven't looked at that yet. Um, there was originally, the original design that we had, I had balconies um, on all of the units surrounding the building, interior and exterior. On um, the latest one, we had done a larger green roof and eliminated the balconies um, previously <coughs> to this one, and now we're kind of back to it would be, it would probably be good to have a mixture of them just from a market perspective. Mm -hmm. um, other ones that you see that we would really be competing against, most of them have balconies. 
Um, so if there were some that we did not do balconies, um, it, it would it would probably be just to hit a little bit lower price point target or something like that. Just to diversify the, just to diversify the okay. market rate a little bit, yeah. Yeah, okay. And so um, I, again, I think it's um, very exciting. It Vibrant is what comes to mind. I've lived in uh, quite a few different communities. I think that's a perspective that I bring to council. A lot of people here have been here for decades and that's awesome um, because they have that perspective and they talk about things in the context of what Marion needs or where we're headed. And um, so I bring the perspective of I've lived in a lot of other places and seen things. And for me, um, this would be just an awesome thing for the community if done right. Um, I can just you know envision it now teeming with life. Um, and it's something for all ages, which is important. And I think from the tax-based perspective for the Marion Independent School District, that's where it would fall. Is that right? Yeah, this uh, everything along Central Corridor is Marion Independent. Yeah, they are um, pinched for space in terms of growing that, and this would be uh, great for Marion Independent from that perspective. So um, thanks again for the specifics, the presentation, and most importantly, the timeline. I think that's been helpful for everyone. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Uh, the next two items are related to this, but they would be actions for Thursday. The first one is just the when the, we receive the formal application for assistance, the council receives and files that, so it becomes part of the official record. And then uh, you do a motion directing staff to negotiate a memorandum of agreement. That's what uh, lets us know that it's time to seriously engage legal counsel and start really crunching the numbers to be able to come back <coughs> to the council with options for how the project might be able to proceed. Excellent. Um, so when we were moving on to the presentation for the new aerial fire truck, and I will relinquish the gavel to, I'm sorry. Oh, um, yep, you're, you're right, I'm sorry, but we are doing um, finance, so um, relinquish the gavel to the mayor, and we are, let's see. Thank you. Yes. So I guess we're pleased. Are there any Sorry. questions on the finance finance agenda before we move on? <coughs> Nothing on there? Okay. Chief. Good evening, Your Honor, <coughs> members of the council. Um, in your packets was a memorandum from me um, asking for you to consider donating our old Engine 91 to uh, Pink Heels, which is a cancer organization um, fighting cancer and helping families with cancer. Um, there also in your packet was a, a presentation that they wanted to give the two people who are starting the Iowa chapter of Pink Heels, um, Diana and Dennis Bramow. They couldn't be here tonight, they're in St. Lucia, but uh, they, that was part of the presentation that they wanted to give tonight. But I would really like to move on this. Um, right now we're storing Engine 91 in Monroe Township Fire Department because we have no room. Um, so I was hoping that you would consider donating this to the Pink Heels organization. Do you have any questions about the Pink Heels organization or about donating the truck? We have tried to sell the truck for two years now. We've had it on an auction site nationally uh, for a year and a half. We started at $29,000 and got no hits. I lowered it to $19,000, we got no hits. I lowered it to $14,000, we got no hits. And as I showed you in my memo that I put it down to $10,000 on gov deals and we still got no hits. So um, I was just hoping that maybe we could help a good organization that will help the, Mar the Marion community as well as the rest of the state of Iowa with that truck, and it'd be nice to have Marion's name on that truck. Question. What, what will they do with that, Chief? Mm -hmm. I just. <coughs> what they do is they paint it pink. Yeah, okay. <laughs> do they There's, leave Marion on it? Yep, yeah, they will have, you know, donated by the city of Marion on that. They want to keep it Engine 91 because 91 <coughs> has some significance to their organization, and I'm not sure what that was. So they're going to keep the Engine 91. It will say Marion on it and they'll paint it pink and what they do is they take donations and they go to families throughout the state that are suffering, someone in their family is suffering from cancer 
and they travel with the fire truck with the lights and sirens and all the community meets up and they give to those families. What is it, what is their geographical region that they support? I mean, is it just Benton or is it all of Eastern Iowa? It's actually the whole state of Iowa. Oh, the whole state of Iowa. The whole oh, state really? of Iowa will be visited by this truck. Oh, wow. Okay. Yes. Mayor Patin has a question. Yeah, um, so other than if we were to approve this donation, it doesn't require staffing or anything on that part once we give it to them, even if they were to come do visits to Marion? Nope. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. We, we, we might help them with uh, maybe escorting them to a home that they might be going to with the pink truck, mm -hmm. but that would be, you know, so firefighters could help give the gifts and things like that, but that would be about it. And that would be on a volunteer basis. That would be neat to have, um, you know, through the state, Marion. I mean, what a generous um, donation and a good cause. And yes. we've certainly tried to sell it and recoup any funds from it. So Iowa does not have one, and many states already do. So it would be is great their first, for Iowa. This would be their first truck in Iowa? This would be their first. Yeah. Awesome. <coughs> okay, other questions? Thank you. Thanks, Chief. Parks. <coughs> how we doing? Good. How are you? Good afternoon. Um, just one item that I had highlighted on the agenda under Parks uh, today. And basically, this comes out of a budget decision as we went through the budget process this year, and that was looking at the uh, stipend that's allowed to the park board, and we're going to sunset that at the end of the fiscal year. So associated with that, what we need to do is we need to clean up a um, chapter uh, of our uh, code uh, related to park board. And basically, uh, what I just have highlighted here is that we're just – Striking out the language associated uh, with the stipend and the $500 a year, and then to align uh, with language that we have in uh, other um, uh, areas of code associated with other commissions and boards, uh, just to put in the verbiage that, uh, that just states that they will not receive any compensation uh, for serving on that board. Okay. Uh, questions on that? Just for the for the purpose of the public, maybe we could just recap. <coughs> the Parks Board has been receiving a stipend because that, that's a remnant from when that was an elected board, correct? Correct. And um, they're no longer an elected board. And in our budgeting discussions, the council felt that uh, to be fair to the rest of the commissions that the, to um, phase out this, this, this stipend. Is that correct? I mean, that's, that's yep, a good. Yep, that's correct. Yeah. Okay, just so in case people are understand or wondering what it is and what we're doing. So, okay. Any other questions on that? Okay, thank you. <coughs> Any questions on the building inspection item or before we move on to engineering? Okay. So basically, Prospect Meadows, as you guys know where that's at, um, they went and started doing some soil testing on their conditions out there, <coughs> and from that they found out that they could not put in a conventional leach type system where it just absorbs into the ground. The soils are not conducive to that. Unfortunately, they have started grading out there. <laughs> and so um, they came to us and they said, you know, what are our options to tying into the, the Marion sewer system? Um, so we'll get into some slides later, and you guys have a, a lengthy memo there. 
Um, but we looked at it, looked at our existing capacity. We're quite a ways away from our existing facility. Um, we looked at different alternatives. The, the main one that they were kind of focusing on was partnering with the Lynn County Solid Waste and combining with their force main system that they have, enlarging it from a four to a six, and then pumping into the city sewer system that eventually goes down to Cedar Rapids. Uh, when we started looking back at our sewer capacity, we found that there was some short-sightedness on some stuff. Um, given that at the time, you know, you don't want to build a 50-inch trunk sewer for, if you're not growing. So you, just like you guys decided, 35th Avenue is not a priority to pave. A future council might think that that was a short-sighted decision, but at the time, that's the decisions that were made. And so you just have to deal with the, the situations that you have, the money that you have, and build what you feel is important. Um, so I'm going to kind of give a high level of that memo and just kind of go through some items if there's questions. Um, but it's pretty, I think that part of it was just 12 pages alone. So hopefully everybody read that. So basically at, at one time, I believe it was in uh, 95, it was decided that County Home Road and Highway 13 would be our boundaries for expanding to the northeast and then only half of that. Well, if you look at our map, we're there. Um, the, there's a memo that Whitlow wrote um, in 2003, I believe it was, that estimated based on past growth that in 2020 we would hit 33,000 people. We're basically at 40,000 right now. Um, and so, you know, it, it makes it sound bad that the past, past decisions were made, but I mean, they were growing very slowly at the time. So th again, there's no point in spending money on, on something if you don't need it at that time and felt that it wasn't going to happen right away. Um, so we looked at a few areas and some, some of the issues, some sewer that was installed in 1958, 1965, um, needs to be upgraded and it's gonna cost about $2 million. So these are just real rough numbers. So when I say CFS is cubic feet per second, and we're looking at the actual peaking value. So we're not talking about average or daily flows. We're talking worst case scenario, everyone flushes their toilet at once and it all comes at once. So th these are the peaking, but you have to design for that because if you don't, it, it backs up in people's basements. So that's what we have to design for. We also design the pipe so that it's only three quarters full to add a little extra buffer in there too. So there's some factors of safety in there. So some of these look a little scary when we say it has a capacity of 7.19 CFS, but it's taking 14.43 CFS. Um, there are some areas when we get heavy rains that the public service department has to go out there and they have to set up their pumps and they just have to pump so that it doesn't go out. And you know, before it was, we, we thought we had a lot of infiltration. Well, we're actually undersized a little bit. So the combination of the two is causing that issue. Um, so this is just a small project, which would be 5,500 lineal feet of 36 inch pipe to upgrade to the 24 inch pipe and a 20 manhole. Um, another area has a 20 inch main that was installed in 1972 that needs to be upgraded. That's about $1.63 million. Again, it has a capacity of 4.6 CFS, but it's taking 8.32 CFS. Um, again, upgrading from a, a 21 inch to a 30 inch and then 20 additional manholes. Another 21 inch area that was in 1972 isn't quite as much. Um, uh, has 4.6 CFS, it's taking 8.32, is about a $0.8 million project. Um, some 18-inch main that was installed in 1995 needs to be upgraded, about $1.04 million. This one has a capacity of 3.34 CFS, and it's only taking 2.77, but with added development, soon that'll be an issue. Um, I got one question on, on all of that. It talked about adding a lot more manholes. Now it's not necessarily adding manholes. That's we're kind of giving the scope of how we're coming up with our numbers. So okay. when we say it's going to cost 104 million dollars, that's because we're installing 4,050 lineal foot of 24 inch pipe and 15 manholes. So we're not necessarily adding more manholes. Okay. Okay. Those are existing already. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I mean, there's a chance that we might be able to salvage the existing manhole, but it's going to have the wrong diameter hole in it. So. Got it. Duct tape. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah got Brian, are you okay with that? <laughs> um, so some some peak areas that we found. Um, uh, 33 inch main in 1958 needs to be upgraded. Um, there's actually a 12 inch berry run um, that we actually have a moratorium that you guys set back on resolution 15484 on, in 2002. And then there's actually, we looked at the possibility of actually doing a gravity feed to Prospect Meadows, which the, the right way to do it would actually, if the landfill wasn't there, would go through the, the low point of the landfill and go towards County Home Road. Unfortunately, they built right where the sanitary sewer should go. So we basically have two options of we either go straight north and get really deep up towards County Home Road and then go on the south side of County Home Road towards them. Um, with that, there is some area that because we have to go so far that we won't be able to serve a certain portion of them. But that does open then the area west of the landfill up for development. Um, so I have Dylan here that's going to kind of go through some of the, the details. I had him run the study again. This was, he did this in a week. So um, as you'll get through the recommendations, we're looking for us to actually get a full-blown study so we can get some answers in there. So just a, a, a few pictures. So this was Marion in 1990 with the existing street network that we have today. So you can see kind of the boundaries of where the houses are versus all the entire street network. So in 1990, we were pulled back quite a ways. And that purple dash line that you can kind of see, that's actually our corporate boundaries that we've annexed in today compared to what it was then. So you can see where the houses are then versus today. Here's 2000, so you can see now Hunter's Ridge is in there. Um, and we're starting to have some more of that development, but there's still not a lot of increase other than that from 1990. Then in 2008, you can see all of a sudden we're starting to get a lot more between 2000 and 2008. And then currently, this is our what we look like up there with our sanitary sewer. So that's as far as we have with our sanitary. So you can tell where County Home Road is. You can see the, the landfill. Um, and so basically how the landfill gets their leachate to us now, I guess I didn't put that in there. Um, so now I'm going to have Dylan come up here and kind of go through the design and kind of some of those decisions that we made. So in 1990, the city had AMIT Engineering do a study on this area that is outlined on the screen. Um, that was the area proposed for the extension of the sanitary sewer, what we wanted to serve with the extension. And they came up with, they teamed up with the planning department and looked at the past growth rates and seeing that we only grew 10% in the previous 20 years, a, a 20,000 population. Uh, they said that we would be able to serve 75% of this this area based on the past growth rates. Uh, at that time it was tabled and then in 94 with Hunter's Ridge and the new Linmar school going in, they brought it back up and said we need to get this extension in. And they recalculated it and they said we could do 75% of the area based on the future land uses. And so at that time, if they were to use the 21 inch existing sanitary sewer, that was there already. If they were to upgrade it, it would serve probably the whole thing, but they didn't look at anything south of 29th Ave. Uh, and so at that time, they decided to not do any upgrades to the system and just extend the 21 inch main. <laughs> and by doing that, they were restricting development to the areas that are shown here, one, two, four, six, and nine. And so in 95, we did that storm sewer extension project. Um, and it was pretty much we were restricting development to this area is what we were doing on the engineering side, but I don't, I couldn't find anything based on council saying that nothing past this could be developed. Um, and so, and then with the 95 extension, we extended Barry's run, which is, it goes up towards Hunter's Ridge. And that was going up there to serve the future predicted developments coming with the golf course and the middle school. And then so in 2000, they wanted to extend the interceptor further up to Glen Rock Farms. And at that point, a study was done saying that that 12 inch main that was installed going up to Glen Rock Farms was 
at capacity with what was proposed to go in and so we put a moratorium on it restricting the area that we could serve in the pink outline is what we are allowed to connect to in that interceptor right now but this can go as far west as Albernet Road we, is what we can serve with that if we were to upgrade that um, and also as you can see this area is outside of what was proposed for the serviceable area in the 95 extension and so then in 2003 we decided to do another extension to or open up more land in the northeast at this time though it was not none of the sanitary sewer to the southwest was studied and see what the impact was done, was going to happen with that they only looked at the existing terminus point that was right by Lucor Road um, and the red in 2002 the red outline is what they were going to serve with that and it was decided that we'd only be able to serve about 50 percent of that area with the 18 inch and it was it wasn't decided to upgrade that just only serve 50 percent at the time because we were only at 26,000 population and it was a, with the growth rates we weren't predicted to fill that basin for 45 years well in 2006 we reevaluated and included the extra 900 acres east of highway 13 to be in that basin and we recalculated the flows based on new future land use maps and we could serve more but it was still under under the capacity or over capacity for what we had there and so as you can see now this is what is all served with the 21 inch main that was installed in 1972 it's at 318% uh, land use of what was predicted we would be putting through to it in 1995 um, and it just was never we never went back and looked at population growth and reevaluated what the capacities were in the sewer and it's not just the sanitary in this area is not a problem it goes all the way to the Berries Creek or the Dry Creek Interceptor and that is um, West 8th Ave and so that whole line from Albernet Road to just about Winslow that is all currently under or over capacity with the flows if we have the peak hour factors in there and then with predicted land use and growth factors the stuff all the other stuff will be over capacity as well so that is what I found in the study that I did the past week I'll turn it back over to Mike so I got a question on these these lines that you're talking about having this huge over capacity have the houses in those regions been having problems um, I've heard of people having problems but again this is you'll get the capacity flows once every five years okay. but you have to design for that and so I I've just had Gary tell me that he has to go out and pump these a lot but yeah, there are certain problems. ones we do yeah so Gary knows if there's a big rain coming, he needs to get his pumps going, and he just has strategic lo locations that he knows from previous floods that right. he sets them up, and uh, solution to pollution is dilution. And that's our that's our band-aid fix right now. Right now, yeah. Yeah, yeah I understand. Yep. Um, so what I would recommend to the council is we immediately allocate funds that are left over from the 29th and Indian Creek traffic study to a sanitary sewer capacity study which is about 170,97304. I know I haven't presented you guys that final report from that study, but it sounded like there wasn't a lot of desire to do much with that. If you guys wanted to save some of that money to do some of those improvements, such as the flashing stop signs or anything like that, we could do that. Um, and then directing staff to prepare a request for qualifications so we can get a consultant on board so we can actually do a full-blown study and so what they'll do is they'll take Dylan's work and build off of that but also what they do is we'll either take our pumps that public service has or they'll bring their own pumps and what we have to do is we have to have them staged for when we have a big rain event so it can't just be a little rain event it has to be a large rain event and unfortunately that may not happen in the season and so we have to try and plan for it um, but at least getting a study done and trying to figure out if, if there's more torums that we need to set for our northeast boundaries um, so maybe development has to stop until we can get this figured out and then kind of come up with a game plan similar to what we do with the Indian Creek study where we said you know right now we're, we're looking at segment 11 and then 7 and prioritize them based on these are the areas that are going 
to be the worst based on flow and slopes and prioritizing it. And then we can put that information in the CIP budget for that stuff and start tackling it. Because it's, it's not a want, this is a need, and we need to address this issue. Um, are there questions about this? Well, how does it, how does it, what is the, I, I don't understand a real timeline here. Uh, I don't know if there's, it's possible to put together a rough timeline, but uh, obviously the study is needed. I don't know when that can be completed. It sounds like that's weather dependent. But how does this also impact the Prospect Meadows so project, except for them putting them up a bunch of outhouses out there? Sure. So Prospect Meadows was going to present after us, was the original plan. Um, they have since decided not to. They're not quite ready. So I don't know what their ask is going to be. Right. Um, <coughs> at the time, they were only proposing 0.11 CFS to add to that, which isn't big compared to the total flow. But that also varies. So we've, we've saw as much as, you know, almost one CFS that they were requesting. So it depends on what their actual ask is. Um, from conversations, I understand they're looking at the possibility of doing restrooms out there, but doing their own storage. And then basically once they get full, they pump them out and take them mm -hmm. to the, the treatment plant. And so that might be something they do. There is a half a million dollar access fee that we would charge them unless council chooses to waive that. I would not recommend that. We already are in enough issues. If it's something where you wanted to say, okay, you guys can pay the access fee, but maybe you do it over 10 years or something, I think we still need to recoup that because we make everybody else pay that. We make schools pay that. We make other nonprofits pay that. I don't know why we would not make them pay that fee. And so I think that number did scare them a little bit because they only allocated $200,000 for their entire sanitary sewer system. And, you know, unfortunately that's, that's, We're running. yeah. So just for clarification, let's just go back here for a second because I'd like to refresh this timeline. So again, they weren't prepared for their sewer issues prior to Prospect their development. You're talking about? Correct. Correct. We as a city chose not to put any services out there because of the development needs and our resources from a city standpoint in the developments that we needed to focus our time and resources on. And now we're right back to where we were because now they're stuck with porta potties at best until this gets resolved, which is now being put on the back of the city again. Am I if, if anything that's incorrect? Request, I mean, they may figure out that they're going to do it themselves. Um, like I put in the, the memo, they basically had those options. They didn't right. like the Port of Johns because of the, the perceived. Um, we told them to look at land to the south of them and maybe put a leach system in there. But they determined that because all their soil borings, except for I think one, was bad on the actual Prospect Meadows site. Um, I mean, we've had these conversations with them a long time that, yeah, it's cheap land, but there's not infrastructure there. Um, so I keep bringing up even water. Cheap. And... Um, you know, they say that they're not going to have a problem digging a well, but they haven't done any water tests. So they could come up with a demand for water service as well. I don't know that yet. Right. So, so, in, so the, uh, in layman's terms, the perk tests aren't supporting a leach field. Are you saying that they could, but they would have to tear up their work? They're saying it does not work. It does not work. No. Okay. Not with the soils that are there. Plus, they've disturbed the entire site. And typically, you need a site that you haven't completely disturbed. Um, we even suggested to them to look at the reed beds and stuff that Ryan's looked at in public service department. So we've we've tried to shoot them other options. Um, we I'm just concerned with, sorry to interrupt you, I'm just really, you know, we're talking about reallocating. It just seems like we spend thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars on studies. So we're going to take our $171,000 to do a study to see if we can facilitate them this service so, so and this take care of our needs at the same time. This study has to be done regardless if you guys say yes or no Prospect Meadows. Yeah, let's, so let, let's be clear right. about that. This is not Ig ignore them for, for, for Prospect Meadows. <laughs> right, that, that's my okay. question. Yes, is, I, I get the yes. feeling that we're going backwards to validate no. why we're running and even thinking of running services because now all of a sudden we're looking at what our internal needs are, which was not part of the CIP even to begin with, not at this stage. So, so pretend that Prospect Meadows is not coming in at all we have to do this study for the city. So you would have been presenting out. this regardless of Prospect yes, Meadows that, issues that's today? that's why I am presenting it. They're not here, okay. so I could have delayed this presentation, but this <clears> is something that has to happen. Well, and, so. and just to jump in um, on planning and zoning in the fall, we approved quite a big um, chunk of Skogman development new coming in north of um, 
Hunter's Ridge, and then all of the development around 35th and, you know, Lucor and that whole, I'm, I'm assuming all of that would tap into the need that you're saying that When we Dylan have. did the numbers, we basically looked at everything that had been approved at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. So I should, that, that's all approved stuff, it's not currently mm -hmm. in? So he's but assuming that it's already flowing to us. Yeah, okay. But so yeah, there's there's so much. So, so this I'll study's going to look out past what's going on today, and it's going to look yeah. at. It has nothing to do with Prospect Meadows. It's going to actually look at our system, say, here's where our needs are. Here's where you need to set a moratorium until you do right. these improvements. Possible. It has nothing to do with Prospect Meadows. This study needs to happen now. Yeah. <clears throat> it's just because they came for the ask, it opened our eyes. But sure. that's, so they are interrelated, but this sanitary sewer study is not because of Prospect Meadows. Could you take your slides back to for me the 2018 boundary lines for the corporate city limits? How far back is that? That's years. Yeah, I'm looking. I'm curious to see how far north we are of county or of. Um, okay, so this development. Are you saying that it's <coughs> outside of our corporate? For the Skogman development you no, just mentioned? No, it's, it's right on top of... So it's between the purple line and the edge of Hunter's Ridge. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask. It's, mm -hmm. it's, yeah, yeah it's, I think is that it correct? is. Okay. It's, it's in our corporate boundaries. Right correct. Now. I was just curious to know how much farther north it would be up to that particular point. Yeah, no, point. it's literally the, there are backyards that exist. I can't think of the name of that street. Sure that are going to be in the backyards of this one street coming through. It's the one that we talked right. about recently that's going to have the first private right. roundabout right. going right. through. Okay, perfect. He, Thank you. But that is, to be clear, Dylan has already accounted for the flows from that in his calculations. That's not on top of what we're already anticipating. Right. And if I remember right from their briefing, that's the last area that is outside of the moratorium area for that line. So there's nothing else that could uh, contribute into that because of the moratorium. Okay. I have a question about if you could go to the, the slide that has the Indian Creek study dollar amount, like 170000 and change. I thought that um, money came from a particular <coughs> um, silo or bucket, I guess, that we're just able to transfer that if we approve it to do so. That money can be transferred from that to a different study? So originally in the CIP was allocated for improvements for that intersection that paid for the study. And so that's, it was originally 200,000. Mm -hmm. And so basically you're just, you're changing the CIP. You guys are modifying it to say, we're gonna go towards the sanitary funds to do this Right, study. and we've already used 28,000 of it for right, that last study. That was yep. done. No, I get that. I just didn't know if we could just to take it from that. My only concern about taking it from that in its entirety um, is that I don't know how much work has been done since we had that meeting, and I agree no one, the school or the city, didn't really seem to have much of a palette to do anything major, but we did talk about um, possible tree removal. I don't mm -hmm. know if that's been mm -hmm. pursued. I, and what I have the not cost pursued anyone until I give you the final report, which I actually have. I haven't reviewed it yet. It'll come to the next council meeting, um, and then you guys can give any direction you want to do that. So, I mean, if you don't want to allocate the entire thing, you can allocate a portion of it. Um, but at, we at least need to get the RFQs sent out and give us direction on that and at least say direct, you know, a portion of that to start that study. Yeah, based upon what I re recall from that, that meeting, I agree, I agree with Renee, there was not a huge appetite to do a lot at that intersection nor necessarily an immediate need for the next handful of years. But the only two things I recall that made sense, with, I don't think none of, either one of them are large dollars, but one is the flashing lights, mm -hmm. not a large expenditure, that's defined. And two on that southwest corner where you got the residential house, and you know, I've, I've sat at that intersection and it'd be nice to remove maybe about 30 foot of trees uh, at that intersection and open that up a little bit more would not impact uh, their view or anything that that house has. So, you know, reserve some dollars for that, but you know, that's my opinion on all, the only dollars that I saw needed to be reserved, so that does free up the majority of it. Wouldn't the county have an interest in this? Have we asked the county for any help? The county have an interest in what? Well, I mean, their, their future development beyond out there. So anytime the county does a subdivision, basically you have a regional detention, you have a regional leach field, and the those developers pay for that. So the the county isn't 
interested. I mean, yeah. as part of the Prospect Meadows discussion, it was a discussion of an ask from the city for money, of Lynn County for money for their shop up there, and from the county waste. Um, but that's a separate, that's com again, completely separate. This study needs to be done irregardless. We have, we're basically talking about two different things here. So Prospect Meadows ask, we don't know what that is yet, because they're not here to ask. I'm just here to ask to do the study so we can look at the city issues that are already there. We, we touched very lightly with the dump people on the <coughs> benzene plume that they're pumping through our sewers. Yep. Could we make that part of our study? I mean, I don't want that stuff backing up in my basement. And uh, do we know how much of that they're pumping through? Do we know how much they are diluting? Do we know anything about <coughs> it? We that have a flow meter could that's be, on that. be part of this. Yeah, they, they, we have a, a meter on that manhole, so we know what flow they're doing. We don't do any tests that I'm aware of of what they're sending at us. We just know how much is coming through it, though. We don't know what it consists of. Um, I'll have to look back, but we, we know the flow, but I think we do reserve the right uh, to test the wastewater and or require any type of pretreatment test. Um, and I think right now our pretreatment agreements with the city of Cedar Rapids, they would actually do the test. I think it'd be a good time to test it myself. How, Mike, you said the process for that is to do an RFQ to find it to get bids as to what the study would actually. Yeah, so it's a request cost. for qualifications. We send it out to engineering firms similar to what we're doing on Seventh Avenue. We find the consultants that are qualified to do it. We pick the one that we feel does the best job at that. We come to you with a recommendation, get a contract with them, and say we recommend X company for this amount of dollars to proceed with this study. So have we known this is, have we suspected this was the case? Have we had any, have we no, just I mean, we, all we of a sudden appeared? No, we had issues when it rained. We didn't realize it was to this level, or we would have brought this to you a lot sooner. Uh, okay. Well, we won't just have curious. any problems when that Minnesota snow melts here and we <laughs> get those pumps out. So get them primed and get them... Get them fueled because we're going to be needing them. Okay. Other questions on that one? So what, what do you need from the council? So there's an item um, number three directing staff to reallocate leftover funds from 29th Avenue and Indian Creek intersection projects to the sanitary sewer capacity study and directing staff to solicit engineering services for the sanitary sewer capacity study. So if you want to specify a certain amount that you're transferring, if you want to leave some to do something at that intersection, that's your guys you can change that. Uh, so how do you do that before we know what, what the study might cost? Like that's I don't uh, so I gave in the memo I explained that I think it was twenty thousand dollars maybe that we did the AMET study, <coughs> but it was quite a bit more for the whole Indian Creek trunk sewer study. Um, and so I don't know, I haven't done a study with this. Can we get the bids Is this before your we estimate? approve? So they're not bids, they're they're or yeah. We, um, if you want to just direct us at this point to for qualifications and wait to allocate the money, yeah, you could. If you want to do it that I, way, in my opinion would be to to do that before we would allocate the money or make just, it public. We just have to make sure. I don't want to go out and ask people to do a bunch of work and say, "Sorry, we're not going to be able to pay you." Right. So we I just don't want to publicly say, "Yes, we'll reallocate a hundred thousand dollars," and off we go. Yep. And then everybody then knows what our sure. I think that that's logical. That. Lo that's logical too. That's fine. Proceed that way. Mm -hmm. so that's how it's written now, so we'll just have to modify it for Thursday. Okay. Well, and related to that, I'd also related to that, I'd also ask that um, you said you just received back the whatever you needed for the um, conclusion of that study for the Indian Creek. So I'd be curious what those dollar amounts for those two items that we would probably move forward on, just so we know what else is going to come out. Yeah, of and that. when I present that, I'll give you your options. Very good. Thank yep. you. Okay. Is that it on that one? All right. Next. All right. Steve Cooper is going to come up and present on our Stormwater Utility Credit Committee. Good evening. Like I said, I'm Steve Cooper, the Stormwater Coordinator for Marion. Um, I'm going to just cut right to the chase and tell you what I'm here for. Uh, we have a stormwater utility credit committee that has not met for four years because uh, we haven't needed to. We haven't really had any credit applications, but I'm anticipating that we will now that we've increased our fees a little bit and we are 
phasing out the cap. Uh, I've already had a couple of uh, property owners call about it, but I don't have a committee anymore. The committee that has already been formed was only made up of four people, and three of them are no longer available. There's one that's only confirmed still on the committee, so I'm asking for council's recommendation on people in Marion, residents or business owners, who they, who you think would uh, be good to serve on the Stormwater Utility Credit Committee. Um, if I were to have a credit application come through tomorrow, I wouldn't be able to make the 30-day turnaround on that. Oh. Um, what had happened uh, five years ago when all of this got implemented, each council member was asked to provide a name of a person uh, and we only got four people out of that. So, so this is a committee that's selected by you? It is a committee that's appointed by the mayor. Okay, so this is just like the, all the other committees. Mm -hmm. Right. So how did, what well, we had it, okay, so I'm just trying to remember how it was done then. The council members proposed names and then the mayor made a recommendation at that time? Yes. And then it was approved by the council like, like all other appointments to committees. Yes. Okay. All right, so we don't have an application uh, process or anything like that? We're we do. Everything's in place. We just don't oh. have the people to serve on the committee because... Okay. Have we advertised it? Hmm? Have we advertised it, like, no. with, through Amber or... Well, th this is... I'm asking for the recommendations oh. from council on how to proceed with this oh, because okay. as it is in the ordinance, for all the information that I have on how to work this committee, the ordinance says this is a committee that's appointed by the mayor. Sure. Uh, how okay. how do we go about com uh, appointing this new Being committee? Stated, huh? Yeah. So, <laughs> how, how many do we need? I mean, seven. Seven. You, you would really need seven people on this committee. Well, uh, what, we only had four before because those uh, only four of the council members five years ago provided names of people to serve on the committee. So, Lana, I mean, wouldn't it, wouldn't it make sense to have Lana. the communications director advertise for the? For the positions, and then also council members, if they have recommendations, they can they can suggest to people that they go online and fill out the application and apply. And then we, like what I've been doing with all all other open board seats or commission seats, is people apply, fill out the application that's submitted, and then um, I either sometimes are they people are recommended to me by the certain department heads that are dealing with with that committee. Um, but in any case, I talked to all of them or interview them. Uh, we just went through a series of interviews for people for the Civil Rights Commission because we had two openings. Um, so one way or another, we set up interviews or some a way for me to talk to them about their interests and why they want to do it. And then, then we make a recommendation. Um, usually I work with the, with the department head and in, 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 um, coming up with a recommendation. Um, and then make it to the council, and then they well, they vote on it. Is that does that yeah. yep. make sense? Does I, I, it work? That's how I can proceed with this. I Probably just, know who we're reappointing if you do have three or four. That yeah. So that one individual would be reappointed if if they want right. to stay on. Right. Okay. The, uh, the other three, one no longer lives in Marion. One of them resigned, and another one retired and lives in uh, in Arizona. So, so when we okay. put out that information, we need to at least be able to tell them approximately how many times a year they'll meet? Do you have an estimate of what that is? It doesn't sound like you're going to meet monthly. Uh, so far, we have not, we haven't met since 2014. Yeah, because so, we I mean, we, we, <laughs> it's kind so of on an as-needed basis get, right now. So We might get 10 applications a year. We might get yeah. none. It depends right. on different property owners, what they want to do to, to reduce their stormwater utility fee. So if Does that I, sound like a yeah. good way to do it? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I think the key is just that the last time around, um, it was direct nominations by individual uh, council members. So I think uh, we wanted to make sure that the council wanted to follow the normal, more normal or more conventional process this time around and not go back through that again. Mm -hmm. I think so, and to just open it up to the entire community. We've been trying to get people engaged and involved and mm -hmm. interested in serving on these committees, and let's open it up to the community and see who's out there that wants to. And if, and if we're having trouble getting interest, then we can do, the council can then do more uh, uh, direct uh, yeah. recruiting, you know, to, to get people interested to apply for it. But it should come through the application process and, yeah. Okay. 
It is on the, uh, there is a checkbox for it on our current board and commission application form. Okay. So we can look and see if we have anybody on file who's indicated an interest for one of those. Uh, not Sounds to um, hijack our Marion Day coming up, but we're going to have vehicles and staff and all kinds of stuff going on in, in the 70 degree weather that I'm hoping for uh, <laughs> that Saturday. Do we already have some kind of booth where we have yeah. positions needed that we could also add this to that and try to so um, lure people? <laughs> I do know that volunteer. the communications director is putting awesome. together a, a brochure of all the committees that are available and we'll have a table at the at the event, and we're, we're staffing that table, by the way. <laughs> and if you I, haven't signed I, I up, you should sign up. Event too. Awesome. I, I have lots okay. of fun stormwater things. For and so then, yeah, we can take applications there or, or talk to people about applying and okay. encourage people to be to be part of it. So let's put the popcorn near that, and we can try to hook <laughs> people with the mm. popcorn. Sign up for a committee. Get some popcorn. Yes, volunteer and get a bag of popcorn. Okay. Yeah. okay. Any other questions for Steve? That's Thank what you. I will do. Thank you, sir. Thank you.